Okay, good evening, everyone. My name is Keith. So that today is our third session for the civil procedure. So before I start this, can anyone see the screen or should I zoom bigger? You can reply your response in the chat box. Okay, so uh, to so continue from the previous, we stop at the general summary judgment. So uh, now for today, I'll be covering some chapters. So the first chapter, uh, so for this one, I'm covering for the summary judgment for question of law, which is order 14A for the rules of court 20 and 12. So for this chapter, right, the key points you need to know that for this summary judgment, basically it covers for the question of law. So uh, to refresh your memory, I think I have I've explained what is the difference between question of law and the question of fact to everyone. So you all still remember, right? Okay, so basically when the party chooses, uh, so that for this summary judgment for question of law, the application can be made by either party or on the court's motion. So uh, only applies to question of law. For question of fact, you can only rely on either uh, 14 or 89, which uh, for 14 we already covered earlier, and the 89, I will be guiding you all later. So for the first, uh, for order 14A rule one, when the question is suitable for determination without a full trial, this is the very, this is the general application for the summary judgment. So when you see, because basically, uh, when you see the question like, both parties want to dispose the matter expeditiously without the necessary going for a full trial. This is where the summary judgment applies. But you have to see what kind of the summary judgment they are going to apply under which particular order. So under this order 14a, when there is a question of law only. So under Order 14A, rule one to rule four. This are how this is how does the summary judgment for under this order will go through. Lah. So especially on rule two, the application is by way of not this of application supported by affidavit or by way of oral. So looking at the case on point. This is the case, Lekas construction. The court held that order 14A can be used to determine question of law or construction of document, not for striking out of pleadings or action. So is everyone clear on this? Okay, so now we are going to the third type of the summary judgment. This one is for the equitable, re uh, equitable relief. So what are the equitable relief I've already summarized at here, like specific performance, rescission of contract, or return of deposit. And usually uh, only it will appear in the question related to the sales and purchase agreement. Let's say today you buy a house from a vendor or you are you are a vendor and then a purchaser bought a house from you and then right now you turn down the deal and then they are claiming back the deposit being paid to you and then uh, you want to dispose the matter without going for a full trial. This is how when it comes this is how it comes to place. So when is the time to apply for the summary judgment under this order? 
when the read and statement of claim is served on the defendant and the defendant has entered into appearance without serving a defense. So what does it mean is that the sequence of, uh, of initiate, uh, initiating a trial is that when plaintiff serve a read and the statement of claim to the defendant, the defendant is given 14 days. Is given 14 days calculated from the date uh, he received. Within the 14 days, he has to file a memorandum of appearance. And then uh, the memorandum of appearance is for him to find a lawyer to defend for himself. So that in the meantime, when he filed an appearance, but before he served his statement of defense to the claimant, uh, to the uh, plaintiff's claim, you can apply for the summary judgment. I hope that I didn't confuse anyone because this is like how the practice goes on. So everyone okay? Okay, so the application for this Order 81 is given under Order 81 Rule 2 Notice of application supported by affidavit. So to effect the service, it is given under Order 81 Rule 2 Sub 3. You have to serve to the defendant within 14 days from the date of issue of the notice of application. So the leave to defend is that when the defendant trying to raise a defense after you have Far, uh, you have applied for the summary judgment, the, def uh, the court will determine whether the, uh, the defense raised by the defendant is a bona fide and, sustain uh, and a sustainable for the defense that he raised. Lah. So it is given under Order 81 Rule 4. The court may give the defendant a leave to defend. So it is up to the court's discretion whether or not to grant the discretion. Lah. And under Order 81 Rule 3, the court may give the judgment in the favor of the plaintiff during the hearing unless the defendant raises a trouble issue or other reasons for full trial. So that this is the logic. Summary judgment is where the defendant has no defense in the plaintiff's belief. So that if the defendant cons uh, subsequently raises a uh, defense, then it is better to go for full trial, then the summary judgment will not apply. Okay? So to differentiate between order 14, and also order 81. So I have summarized into a table so that as you can uh, as we can see, the stage of application for order, uh, order 14 is that after the D uh, after the defendant has entered into appearance, which is given in order 14 rule one. But order 81 is after the read and the statement of claim served to the defendant, which means that uh, you see the difference. Uh, what is the difference between these two is that you not necessarily for the defendant to enter into appearance, you can straight away and apply. Is that okay? Okay, so the more that, uh, that that means order order eighty one uh is like uh even if the defendant didn't uh enter appearance, he can still go for the uh, sorry sorry this one uh sorry I think I made a mistake here I have to say sorry just not as what we said uh without defense ma so I have to put it the defense here lah. Okay. So in uh so that so that means even the defendant enter into appearance, but before he served his defense, which means that 
after he entered into appearance, you already you can and you can apply for a summary judgment already because you know definitely the defendant is going to be liable already, which means that you are on the strong point that the defendant is going to be liable for what his misconduct or something like that. So that means that uh, if the defendant uh, doesn't enter the appearance, uh, but then, but then later on he uh, can he he doesn't enter appearance, but then after that, um, uh, he he um, he comes out with a defense after that. Let's say. Okay. Uh, so in this case, what happens? Okay. So Shamala, to answer, uh, to answer your question, right? When the defendant did not enter into appearance within the time frame, right? Actually, no matter how, the plaintiff is ha uh, has the option to enter into a JID. Right. Yeah. So that the JID, I think I have I've explained to everyone, right? So that the calculation of fourteen days, if you did not file an appearance, so that the plaintiff actually can go and apply to enter into a JIDA, which is judgment in default in the, uh, for appearance, so that your defense can only be raised out when the judgment is uh, when the judgment of default is given. It's not on the summary judgment. Okay. Summary judgment is that when you already enter into appearance, ma. Yeah. Yes, that oh, oh yeah, yeah. That means yeah. you have to uh... Enter appearance first, then only you can go for some decision. Yes. And somehow, uh, and somehow some lawyers uh, mm -hmm. can also lose on the summary judgment, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Because uh, I think in the order, it, uh, order 14 rule 1, which says that there must be in the plaintiff's belief that the defendant has no defense. But anyhow, because of some time, when your client never tell you the whole truth, then subsequently you lose the case. Lah. I see. Okay. It happens. It happens. Oh, yeah. So okay. the biggest, so the so the biggest uh difference as we can see from the uh, from the table, right, is the mm. mode of application. Because mm. under order 14, it must be notice of application supported by affidavit. However, under order 81, it can be done orally. So mm -hmm. that is the difference. I I'm trying to I'm trying to okay. highlight for you all. Okay, got it, got it. Thank you so much. Okay, so the next chapter is summary judgment against squatters. So it's given under order eighty nine. So what are the squatters? Uh, actually, squatters is quite like an English law, which means that uh you are staying at that place for a certain period of time without the consent of anyone. So that, to give you a very good example, uh, so you see, uh, most of the residential areas, they have their own security condo, uh, security condo. But in fact, these are illegal because you haven't got the consent from the local authority to build such a security bundle at there or you have you or you did not apply for any tol temporary occupying license so that when the local authority is going against uh for the for the place right they will issue a summon and the calculation is pretty pretty serious one it, because it counts by how many units of the pondo you have over there and then how many years you have been using, you have been using so that the amount can, can be quite huge also. So, okay, so going back to this, the squatter, which means that you are like simply staying at someone's place without the knowledge or the consent of the landowner. Because in Malaysia, land law is using, the Malaysia land law is using a torrent system so that the adverse possession, which is an English law, does not apply to Malaysia. Lah. So, now the question is whether Order 89 can be used to evict a tenant. 
this is quite common, uh, commonly asked lah, because somewhat, uh, somehow you may confuse like this tenant haven't paid me the rent. And then instead of using other way, I'm trying to use order 89 to evict a tenant who refused to pay me the rental. So, uh, and however, order 89 is not applicable because a tenant is not a squatter per se. So that the best way you can use is to use order 14 or file an injunction to evict him out. So how to justify the conditions to use order? Hmm? Did I hear anyone? Yes, Esther? Okay, I guess Esther just wrongly unmuted herself. Uh. <laughs> okay, so how do we just uh how do we decide whether or not to use order 89? So this is given under rule one when a person claims possession of land alleged to be occupied by a person without any license or consent, which I have explained just now. So the case on point is Bohari Tae. The court held that. The occupier having a temporary occupation license is not a squatter, so that Order 89 is not applicable. So, as what I, uh, as per the example I given just now, the temporary license is considered as a safeguard for you to claim yourself having a certain consent to use that particular land. Okay? Okay, so uh, to further to further explain what is a temporary occupation license, it's a concept derived from the torrent system and is a license to occupy the land for one year and you can renew la by the state authority. So the application to uh, application for the summary judgment under order 89 is that, you have to file originating summon under form A plus supporting affidavit. So in this case, uh, as we mentioned just now, uh, there are a lot of the service requirement, but here it doesn't really necessarily to have served the notice under order 89. However, you have to be, you have to be more careful on the contents in the affidavit in support AIS. The interest in the land, how does the land occupy and no knowledge of any name of the occupier or occupiers. So now come to service of the OS. If the, so it's given under rule four. La. If the occupier, you know his name or his identity, you serve it personally, or leave the copy or send to the occupier at that place. However, it also can be, you also can follow the direction given by the court, like you appoint someone to serve it or how lah. And furthermore, under rule four sub two, the court may direct the service of the originating summon by the following. Affix a copy at the main door or any part of the premise, if practicable, insert, in, insert the OS and the affidavit into a letterbox with a sealed envelope. This is just based on uh, what I have copied from the rules of court. La. Okay, now another question is whether the occupier can be made as a party. Yes, this is given, this is given in Order 89, Rule 5, the defendant who
sorry ah, I guess my I guess my connection just went out. I am so sorry for that. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, just now the connection gone wrong so that I will be share. Uh, so where were we just now? We are stopped at here, right? Okay, so we come to here. Whether the occupier can be made as a party. So, yes, this is given under Order 89 Rule 5. The defendant who is not named can be joined as the party at any stage of the proceeding. Okay, when it comes to a uh, hearing already, so under Order 89 Rule 6, the judge during the hearing and will give the final order to the plaintiff. Okay, now uh, when any of the any of the party is uh, when the defendant appear and trying to set aside the order, yes, is given under order 89 rule 8. The court has the power to set aside the order as it think just and fit. Yeah, this is what I have mentioned just now also. If you want to, if you think that um, finding an alternative way to evade the squatter, yes, you can use an injunction, which I will be, which I will guide you all in the later chapters. Lah. So far, we have covered uh, 14A, 81, and 89 so that including the previous one we have covered four types of the summary judgment is everyone all good with these four summary judgments you can respond in the chat box ah uh. okay Uh, yeah, I think I've said this previously. So I will set uh so as usual, I will share the share this uh PowerPoint to the group later. So if any one of you want to uh revise again, you may I have put the question over here so that you all can refer to the uh slide lah. Now charge action. Charge action, I think you all might have covered it during your landlord classes, right? So uh just uh just want to ask a question. Does any uh does everyone already fully uh does the landlord class already finish with you all? Okay. Cool. Because uh, in this chapter, it's more on the issue of charge. So the charge is under land law. And then um, essentially a charge action is to deal with the problem where you already charge your land to a charger who already, who already took charge of your land. Now the question is you already defaulted the payment, and it's typically a landlord question. So the charge action in under civil procedure, which we cover is uh, usually on how do we challenge the order for sale? So that to recall your memory, I think there is one case, Lao Li Lian, which has given three examples. First thing is there must be a fail to meet the conditional precedent then uh exception to indefeasibility and then the equity correct me if i'm wrong because under the 
under this case, right, I still remember there's one, there's one word cause to the contrary, and then there are three principles on how does uh, on what does it mean by cause to the contrary. So what is a charge then? In Malaysia, there are two cases. First one, your charge can be done by equitable charge, which is Maybank and Zahari, or registered charge, Tebi. What is a foreclosure? The, when the court grant an order for sale, this is for the judgment creditor to recover the debt from a judgment debtor. Now the procedure. The procedure of a charge action is by OS or read, and then I already screenshot the order 83 rule 1 for your reference. Now, if the action is begun by OS, by way of OS, then order 82, uh, order 83 rule 2 and 3 will apply. On rule 2, service of the OS and the affidavit in support to the defendant is not later than four clear days before the hearing day. And then if the hearing is adjourned, the plaintiff must serve a notice to inform the defendant when is the next hearing date. Now, uh, under, now under Order 83, Rule 3, the contents in the affidavit must comply with strictly like quantified amount, true copy of a charge, and then how does the right of possession arise? Because it usually comes when you are going to challenge whether the order for sale can be set aside. Yes, you have to see whether order 83 or 82 has complied. So if there's a non-compliance, according to the case of Lam Chun Realty, the court held that the requirements under Order 83 Rule 3 must be complied with strictly. Otherwise, the order for sale can be set aside. So far, so good. Okay. So we come to offer to settle. Offer to settle means that um, you both parties are in the dispute so that uh, when one party offers another to make a settlement before the judgment is given, it is done, uh, it can be because uh, you may, maybe, lah, maybe just a possibility that someone already know that he or she is likely to lose the case so that this is how offer to settle comes into place. So that everything when uh when it comes to offer to settle, right? Usually the discussion will be done under uh done by way of without prejudice. So that does and uh is everyone still remember what is without prejudice communication under your evidence law? Okay, so since it's a without prejudice communication so that um, right now, let's say if I, if Dr. Chi sues me and then uh, throughout the trial and then I'm in the position that I'm going to lose already. He is claiming me for 1 million. And now I guess if I'm going to settle, uh, if I'm going to offer Dr. Chi with an amount of 800,000, uh, maybe I, I can save some cost. Lah, so that this is how, uh, how an offer to settle takes place. It's usually before the judgment is given. Lah. Okay, so to discuss the stage of application, usually it's after the commencement of action, which means that you already served the pleadings, like 
statement of claim, and then you already exchanged the pleadings, but it can be done even before the commencement of action. If yes, then the rules of contract applies. This is given in the case of Borden Hammer. So, time to apply for offer to settle is given under Order 22B, Rule 2, where, the, where before the court disposed the matter, so that you can make at any time, even though after the trial. Because after the trial, there are still a period for the counsel to submit the documents, and then during that time, you already know that you are on the lower hand, so that you are trying to take chance whether you can get a more favorable, uh, not, not judgment, a more favorable sum to settle off this case. Lah. So, with regards to the offer to settle, to uh, what is acceptance, which uh, for acceptance is that when you make an offer, when is the good timing for the party to accept your offer? So this is given under Order 22B Rule 3. When the time is fixed, then the acceptance is within the stipulated period. On the other hand, when the time is not fixed, you can except at any time before the court disposed the matter. When there's an acceptance, you can choose to reject, right? So if you want to re withdraw the acceptance, uh, if you want to withdraw the offer, you have to serve a notice in Form 35. This is given under Order 22B, Rule 3 and Sub 3. If you want to accept, then you just serve a notice in Form 36. This is given under Order 22B, Rule 6, which is a notice of acceptance of the offer. Okay? Now the cost, uh, the cost at uh the cost in this chapter means that when you already dispose the matter, since uh there's no win, no lose lah, so that you have to pay for the cost like uh how the court fee lah in the layman term we say court fee lah. Then if the if there is no specified uh the cost is not specified then the parties will have to bear the cost on their own. So another way around is that offer to contribute. Offer to contribute means that when there are multiple defendants and one of the defendant wants to make an offer to the plaintiff's claim. So that let's say right now we got two uh, one party is willing to make the offer to settle. Another party is not willing. So the one, the party who wants to make the offer to settle, you uh has to follow this uh is applicable to this situation. Offer to contribute, so that the not uh so that under order twenty two B rule eleven, the defendant can make an offer to contribute. Uh by using the form un, uh, in Form 37, and the court may make the following orders, which is, first thing, pay the cost who made the offer, or indemnity, uh, indemnify the, de, uh, the defendant who has made the offer, which means that, oh, so that in, in the end, let's say right now, Dr. Chi, is suing me and another person for one million. Now, I am going to make an offer to contribute. I'm going to make him a lesser sum, like uh, if divided by two is 500,000, right? Now I offer to Dr. Chi, 300,000 can, uh, 300, can settle. Okay, he accepts already. So the remaining 700,000, if 
so that from my portion, I already cut off my. So right now, on the B side, there is another 500,000. So in the end, if the court uh, gives the judgment that, oh, uh, now it's 1.1 million. So that means uh, for Dr. Chi's portion, he has to pay an extra because he does not make an offer to contribute. So is this explanation okay? I hope I did not confuse any one of you. Okay, now, what is the difference between a summary judgment and offer to settle? Summary judgment essentially is when the, de the defendant has no defense. Okay, and another one is Offer to settle is not necessarily to say that the defendant has no defense, but the defendant just want to settle or dispose the case faster or quickly without waiting the full trial, uh, without waiting the full judgment given by the court. Lah. This is what uh this is all about offer to settle. Now we come to another one. Interim payment. Interim payment is that, uh, let's say the defendant injured you. Now you want to sue him during the during the cost, uh, during the during the procedure, right? During the uh, during the time, right? In the meanwhile, you are in the usually is in a tortious action. So that right now, let's say you already admitted to a hospital and then you need certain sum of money to settle the hospital bill. Yeah, so that in the exam, uh, in the past year questions, if you attempted to do the past year questions right, you will see this keyword to elevate the financial hardship suffered by the plaintiff. So when you see this kind of the keyword right, most likely, lah, it is all about interim payment. So how to apply for interim payment? According to Order 22A, Rule 2, Sub 1, after the defendant enter into appearance. Then, Rule 2, you have to file a notice of application in Form 33. Furthermore, you the notice of application have to be supported by the affidavit and the contents of the affidavit you have to follow under sub 3, sub A to sub C. And then the service of notice of application and the affidavit to the defendant is not less than 14 days before the return date. Then the court may allow for second or subsequent application for interim payment. So uh, it means that the, plain, the plaintiff actually can apply for more than one time of the interim payment. And the order by the court is given under order 22A rule three, where the court may order the defendant to make an interim payment but not exceeding then the claim which means that okay right now let's say i'm claiming for ten thousand now the interim payment is like oh first application i'm applying for one thousand to settle the hospital bill and then i claim another time for another thousand so that in the end, the defendant only has to pay me for like uh, for the 8,000 uh, after the judgment is given if the court allows the full and final claim is on 10,000 full because I uh, already applied for 2,000 during my applications for the interim payment. So uh, furthermore, the court may order 
the defendant to make interim payment if the defendant is an insurer, public authority, or a person with the means and the resources to make the interim payment. So uh, this one is an additional point. Order 22A, Rule 7, where the order of for interim payment shall not be specifically pleaded unless it is directed by the court or with the consent by the defendant. So as what we have as what I explained just now, whether the P uh, the plaintiff is allowed to apply for more than one interim payment, yes. This is provided in the case of David Chalaya. Actually, this case, uh, um, I will say this David Chalaya actually is a very, very lucky person. So uh, it was happened in KL Central, Brickfields. You know there is a monorail station, right? David Chalaya is a reporter. And then the time, uh, he was injured by the falling wheel of the monorail. And then he managed to survive. Lah. That's why I say he's quite lucky. And then uh, he has applied two times for the interim payment. And the court allows it. So that it doesn't limit on how many times you can apply for interim payment. As long as your final claim is there already. Let's say you are claiming for 10,000, no matter how many times you claim, you will not exceed the final claim one. So is there any question before we move to the next chapter? Okay, if there's no question, then I'll move on to the next uh, next chapter, which is the third-party proceeding. Okay, the third-party proceeding, uh, uh, just sharing my view. Uh, because on a certain point of time, uh, I was also quite struggle. what is the difference between a third-party proceeding and adding a court, uh, a court defendant in the case. So that how to how to suggest you all is that you have to see which side are you advising in the question. So let's say you are advising the plaintiff, obviously you are you you can only add a core defendant. But if you're advising uh the, the defendant, right, the best option is that you bring a third party action against the third party. Are we okay? Now, when, uh, as I mentioned, when the defendant has entered into appearance, then the plaintiff, uh, then the, sorry, then the defendant can bring an action to the third party for any indemnity or for any contribution. Usually this is the case. When one incident happened, there will be a plaintiff suing a defendant. But the defendant is at the point that actually it was not wholly on my fault. In, the, in between, there also something happened which has uh, which caused this happen so that usually in the tortious action, right? What we call uh, break in chain of causation, yes. So that it's not only wholly on my fault. There's also somebody else. So since the uh, since the plaintiff did not know, that's why as a defendant, I bring the third party. I'm bringing an action against the third party for any indemnity or contribution. So 
uh, the contribution under under uh, order 16 rule 1 sub 1 uh, means that uh, you are going to sue the third party and then he or she is liable for any liability uh, for any negligence that he or she has caused lah. So it or uh, uh, as what I said just now, these are commonly used in the tortious action. So the purpose of a third party proceeding is for the for the defendant to proportionate the liability between the t the third party or third parties. So this one I also covered earlier. How to differentiate? Yes, this is uh you have to see who are you advising at that point of time. So the next question is whether the leave of court is required to issue a third party notice. So uh for this situation when the defendant enter into appearance but he has not served his defense then you can then the defendant can issue a third party notice without the leave of court it's given under order 18 uh, order 16 rule 1 however if the defendant has entered into appearance and served the defense or the third party proceeding is against the government then yes, you have to uh, apply for the leave of court. It's given under six, order 16 rule 1 sub 2. For the government one, it's given under 73 rule 8. How to apply? Ex parte notice of application supported by affidavit. Now when it comes to service of a third party notice, it's given under rule 3 sub 2. The notice shall serve on every single third party. And then the third party must enter into appearance as given under Rule 4. And the defendant must apply to the court for the third party direction. The third party direction is actually for the court to make a uh, to, for court to make a ruling whether the third party is liable for the negligence that he or she has caused. Okay, the now we have a question. Whether a defendant can bring an action up against a third party after the limitation period? This one is a very, uh, I would say a very old case. Lah. The court held that lah. The commencement of the limitation period uh, is from the date when the defendant found liable. So that means it is like how to say uh, you got extension of the limitation period already. However, in the reason case, KL equals cities of Real Bahad, which is more making sense, the court held that you found. Uh, you bring the action against the third party after the limitation is not allowed. And then the court struck out the application because uh, there is an inordinate delay in the application and it is prejudicial to the plaintiff. Okay, any question for this chapter? Okay, if there's no question, then I will move on to the next chapter, which is interpleader proceedings uh, under Order 17 Rules of Court. So in this chapter, I uh, these are the areas that we will cover. What are the types of interpleader 
how to use each type of the interpleader and the procedure involved. So basically, there are two types of interpleader. The first one is stakeholder interpleader, which means the one who holds the a stakeholder who holds the property of two claimants. So the property can be a money, a proper uh or any debts or like in any form of the assets. Lah. So another one is sheriff interpleader. It is executed by a court bailiff. So that the court bailiff means that uh, the court officer who is holding a seized items under the execution of writ of seizure and sale. So the purpose of interpleader proceeding is that for the court to determine who is the rightful owner over the claimants so that and also it is to prevent the innocent defendant being sued by two claimants so uh, the reason why i put keyword worry of being sued uh, i will cover it later okay so here are the typical scenarios how on how to apply for inter interpleader proceeding so that when more than one person claiming the ownership of a sum of money this one is the first one secondly two persons threatening the innocent party that he or she will be sued if the property is not returned return to either one of them okay application for interpleader proceeding for stakeholder interpleader is given under order 17 rule 3 by way of OS and the supporting affidavit. But for sheriff interpleader, on the other hand, is by way of notice of application supported by affidavit. It's totally different. So uh, for the contest in the affidavit, is given under order 17 rule 3 sub 2 so that the person has to state that he has no interest in the property Se this is the first one secondly it does not collude with any claimants third one he or she is willing to transfer or pay the property to the court and then the service of OS or the notice of application according to order 17 rule 4 you have to serve it personally at least seven days before the return day however only OS must serve personally uh, personally and the notice of application is not necessary to serve personally the notice of application shall be in form 29. Um, I am not sure if I have told every one of you, when you see the word shower, actually you must comply with strictly because a shower in the, in the statute itself carries a more high, uh, a higher, a higher level of mandatory la, so that you must, you die, die, also must comply. Failing to comply, your case will gone. Okay, then we come to order by the court. Under order 17, rule 5, the court will fix a date for hearing and summarily de determine the issue. The plaintiff's right of prosecution will be barred forever if he fails to appear at the hearing. Now, looking at the case on point, in Hong Leong Bank and Mandu Chaka, so uh, the court held that there must be a potential suit. Okay, now it comes back to it comes back to this slide. Why I say there must be a keyword worry of being sued. This is given in this case. A mere anticipation of suit will not suffice the application for interpleader. 
And also this is given in the case of the Tuan Te Kim Te Salina and Kor. There must be a real foundation for expectation of meaning Su. So uh, to summarize these two cases, uh, there must be a genuine threat of the innocent party being sued. Cannot simply say like, oh, I will sue you. When you are go when you are doing nothing, your application of interpleader proceeding will not suffice. So that these are the here, these are the cases where the court held that there are two. Actually, there are two conditions. The first thing is there must be two claimants claiming the ownership of the property, and then the innocent party is under a threat of being sued. Okay? Okay, so uh, I know today I am rushing and so sorry for being so rushed. Since this is the final chapter already for today, does any one of you have any question along the along the chapters I have covered today? So far, the chapters are okay or not. Uh. I scared today's session is looks a bit it looks a bit rushed because uh I only prepared some chapters. Uh. I'm so sorry and also for just now the connection went out so that uh maybe some of that uh, some of you all who has joined previously left the chat or left the meeting. I'm so sorry for that. Uh yeah. So yeah. Can I can I can I know? I mean, how do we like um identify when a exam question uh this is on order fourteen A uh, or it is order fourteen? I mean, which summary judgment? So I mean, from the exam question, any any keywords that we can uh, actually grasp uh to to let us uh, uh know that it is order fourteen or order fourteen A. Okay, Shamala, I I think I know what uh I think uh could you give me a few seconds uh because I'm go uh okay for to answer your question right so basically as I said when you see the question itself carries a keyword like um both part uh both parties are going are uh, the defendant sorry. Is the defendant going to dispose the case expeditiously or quickly without going for full trial? You will see this quite often in the past year exam questions. So that when you see this word already right, uh, very high likely, like I would say very high likely, it's on the summary judgment. So then you have to see, oh, it's under 14, or under 14A or 81. So then you will go on to feel, you have to look through the facts. So if right now are uh, just like a good and good and uh the good source and believer, okay, this is order 14. You cannot run. So on the other hand, if you are claiming a deposit because of the contract is terminated. Then you are going to claim for the deposit, specific performance, then order 81 applies. 
So the most struggling part is order 14A because it is not that really often comes out uh, in the exam question. So how to see the, uh, as what we have covered, uh, order 14A is on the question of law. So that the, uh, since it applies to the construction of document, so you have to see whether the construction of document itself uh, is legal or not, is legally or not. So this is how the, how does the application, I see. Okay, all right, I got it, I got it. So that means to say that, like for example, like if the question uh, talks about limitation of time, that is question of law, right? Like let's say they didn't follow and something like that. So can we bring that as R14A? Um, sorry, come again. No, what I mean is limitation of time. When we talk about limitation of time, let's say, in the question, I mean, they talk about limitation of time and, and they didn't follow that particular rule. So consider that would be a question of law, right? So if in that case, it is order 14A, right? I mean, in that, in that scenario. When you when you are coming to the question or uh, when you're coming to the question on the limitation period, uh, uh -huh. usually you don't need to go for summary judgment because you can raise a preliminary objection to strike out or uh -huh. during the trial, uh, I mean during the PTCM, uh, the pre-trial case management, or even uh -huh. even, uh, okay. even uh, at the time uh, when you was served with the pleadings, uh, you can really strike out. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I, I, I also I can okay. Sorry, Ashamala. I'm so sorry to ask you. Mm -hmm. Uh so you are in the first sitting, right? No, no, second. Second. Second attempt. Yeah. Second attempt. Okay. Yeah. Because uh one of my friend uh last time uh, during a third attempt asked me a asked me a question uh, which is even even funny. More than this, I can guarantee. <laughs> Yes, it's more it's more funny because uh the time uh is it talks about pleading. So after the pleading chapter is the striking of pleading, order 18 and rule 19. And then he asked me, hey bro, striking of pleading uh, means that your entire suit gone. Uh. I say if you write like this, your entire your entire paper gone, uh, bro. It's true. <laughs> Yeah, because for me as a marker, if I see this kind of answer, I will just put a zero on it and that's your full mark. Yeah, correct. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm just, I'm just uh, I, that was a very bad example. But uh, when it comes to like question of law, like for example, like an agreement. So within the agreement, something that they didn't follow and all that. Okay, so that could be a question of law. So in that case, we can actually go for order 40 day, right? Yes. Yeah. But, uh, to, okay, so Shamala, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. I, I, I got the answer. Okay, because I saw there's another question from Sandeep. So Sandeep said that uh, maybe I can discuss some PYQ next time. Mm. Okay, so uh, actually I already discussed with Dr. Chi uh, that because this is what we have prepared this is what we go through previous uh, last year. After after the all the chapters cover, I mean at or about la, your preparation for the exam, right? We will schedule for few sessions like how to guide you through how to guide you all through the past your questions. So that never mind. Uh, and in the meantime. Okay, thank you for the suggestion. So for the upcoming session when I'm preparing my slides, right, I will try to put some exam questions. So uh, by looking at the question itself, right, you will be more familiarized with how the question being tailored and then you will, uh, you will know roughly lah, on how to structure your answer. But, uh, just want to check with you all. Uh, the cost, uh, the 
the class is almost ending, right? Because now it's on, uh, now it's at the end of March already, and then your exam, I guess, is scheduled at mid or about the end of July. So by now, I think most of the big subjects uh, should be fully covered, right? Should be finished already, la, except for the probate or bankruptcy. La. Okay. Then, good. Uh, so that I will suggest you all um, try not to do, uh, try to try to uh, see those, try to see la, those questions, those past year questions. Please don't try on the full marks first. Uh, because for me, for me myself, uh, I also don't dare to do the full marks question first. But maybe you have to be more familiarized with the style of question. And then from that, you will be more and more for uh more and more at, uh, expert on how to identify the question. You will get to know that because whatever we cover in the throughout these three sessions, right, is just purely on that particular chapter. But in the exam, it could be mumbo jumbo because. In for this civil procedure, right? They are having 37 or 35 chapters, now, but yeah, it's more than this. So that in one single question, it can be mixed up with two or three chapters or more than that. So uh this is what I'm I suggesting to you all right now. Try to do some partial question first. If you are confident enough, you can start with the full mark question. And the reason why I say you go and see the full mark question is that I believe there is a logic for them to allocate the marking. So when there is a 15 marks question, usually there must be there might be three or four issues inside the question itself. So that oh you see whether or not there are three or four, and then you can cross referencing and then you see oh whether you are on the you are on the track already to answer the questions, then you will see and know how to improve yourself. But uh to be very honest to you, you may start off with structuring a full answer, not just a Pin uh not just the how to say yeah uh, but like the skeletal answer like putting a point a, a dot like oh this is a summary try to do the full mark first the full question uh the full answer first it helps you to do the time management and helps you on how to write a short and simple question because during the exam time you are given you only have 45 minutes to answer a question, including your rest time. Because after, after a round of writing, your hand will be very, very tired and then you need some rest while doing the, uh, the next question. So that I would suggest you all try to do some past your questions first before I share with you all. Is that okay? But never mind. For the upcoming session, I will try to identify the past year questions are uh, because for my last year, for my last attempt uh, of last year, actually I have completed about five to six PYQs. So that includes the main paper and the supplement. So that after a round, then you will be, okay, when I see this sentence, okay, so I already know that, okay, uh, very high likely the issue is for this chapter, okay. So when you know already, then everything is on the pin, it's just a like pinpoint so that your structure of answer will come to there and you just need to flip the relevant order and the rules, okay? All right, uh, thank, uh, if there's no further question from you all, Thank you for everyone to spend your time. I know 
I know now everyone is quite pan uh is quite anxious already because now it's end of March and then I guess you all need some extra time and maybe lah maybe some tips for you all how to go through this exam. I know it's a very very tough exam. Yes, I understand. So that uh to finish this class, I will. Uh, if there's no any further question, then this session will close. And then the recording I will share to Dr. Chi. And then also the slide for today will also post it in the group later. All right. Okay. Anyhow, I will put us, uh, since you all, uh, since we all are in the same group, for any question uh, relating to this subject or other subject, you also can reach me out. Except for probate, uh, because I dropped my probate uh, for, the four, for the four rounds of CLP. I can only help you all uh, the chapters like, uh, the subjects like contract, uh, which is a GP, civil, criminal, uh, evidence, and also the PP as much as I could. You all can drop me a text and I will try I, and I will respond to you as soon as I could. Okay, thank you for everyone. Good night, all the best. Thank you.